Hi, good afternoon, um, and welcome to Understanding Donor Advised Funds and Their Donors. I'm Ruth B. Cambridge, and I'm NPQ's Editor-in-Chief. We're really pleased to be able to talk to you today about donor advised funds, even in the midst of the busy, busiest fundraising season of the year. We all know that donor advised funds are growing in dollars and donors at a very rapid pace. And of course, they have their advocates, their detractors, and others who just want to see them regulated properly as they grow. We're not going to try to parse those issues this afternoon, but we've published extensively on them. So if anybody's interested in um, understanding more about um, the issues that people have posed about donor advised funds, you can look on our site, on our website. Even among many who are nonpartisan about the growing size and importance of donor advised funds as funding intermediaries, they can seem shrouded in mysteries. For those interacting with a donor advised fund, or more often a donor who has a donor advised fund, however, the processes are not so very different from what many of us have experienced in fundraising from individual donors. I'm joined today by Amy Pirozolo, the VP of Marketing at Fidelity Charity. Um, Fidelity Charitable is one of the larger donor advised fund sponsors in the country um, with 123,000 donor accounts. That gives um, Amy a real bird's eye view of what it is that donors are, who they are and how they function. And so um, what she's going to bring to us today is, uh, is an understanding of what they've noted through years of managing these funds. Today we'll help you understand the mindset and giving trends among this important donor base. We'll also be giving you practical tips you can apply to your fundraising strategies. The, this webinar is being recorded, so you don't have to ask me about that. We will send uh, the slides and the recording afterward along with the resources that are mentioned. So please stay tuned for that email. That's always the most popular question we get during any of these webinars, um, but uh, it, we, we will always send you the slides and the recording after anything we do. We're also excited to take all of your questions. Please submit any questions through the question box in the bottom, in, in the go to webinar control panel, and we'll have a discussion section at the end of the conversation where we'll answer them for you. Finally, we would be remiss if we didn't thank our sponsors who are making it possible today for us to bring you this webinar. This webinar is brought to you by AccuFund, which is the financial management ERP software nonprofits have relied on since 2001. The AccuFund endowment suite helped you manage all of your audit, donor communication, pooled investment allocations, spend calculations, disbursement, and reporting needs. We are also today on social media, so please chime in with all of your questions and comments using our hashtag, hashtag DAF donors. Thank you for being with us today and now welcome Amy. Thank you, Ruth. It is so great to join you and really, really appreciate the opportunity to participate today. As Ruth said, my name is Amy Perosolo. I head up the uh, marketing for Fidelity Charitable, and that means I'm responsible for three primary areas. First is supporting our team of charitable planning consultants in their quest to help advisors learn how to integrate charitable planning into wealth planning conversations. The second is around donor education um, to help make donors' granting experience simpler, more effective, and more rewarding. And then the third, which is why I'm here today, is really helping nonprofits understand who these donors are and how to reach this general generous group of, of folks for your fundraising strategies. So again, it's really my privilege to be here. Um, Ruth, appreciate the invitation from you and your team. So I'd love to start with a story. Um, imagine you're a nonprofit, uh, and I am a donor, and I tell you that I, uh, you are responsible as a nonprofit for 
uh, educating and providing preschool education for low-income children in a small city in Ohio. And imagine I am your donor and I say to you, I can help educate 79 more children than you normally would have been able to educate. I'm pretty sure you would want to speak with me. Um, and that is the story of Dan and Jill Francis, uh, two of our donors, and the work they did uh, hand in glove with an, a small organization in a small city uh, in Ohio. And they were able to educate in their lifetime when we did these numbers um, a year or so ago, they educated over 743 ch uh, preschool children, 79 of which would not have had that opportunity had it not been for the $170,000 of incremental funding as a result of using a donor advised fund. And that's a combination of the fact that Dan and Jill uh, contributed appreciated securities uh, and the investment growth in their account that they were able to multiply their impact to this charity and that charity was thrilled. And that's really the power of giving through a donor advised fund um, and part of what we believe is an important role uh, in the sector that we play. Next slide. Now, based on uh, the most uh, recent comparable uh, information, you're going to see information on this slide from uh, 2017, but that's because the um, next um, NPT report on donor advised funds will not come out until 2019, which reflects 2018 data. So looking back to compare apples to apples, we're looking at 2017 data here. Um, giving uh, has grown overall from 2016 to 2017 by 5%. Giving from donor advised funds, that's grants out of donor advised funds to end charities, grew 20%. So that's a huge increase. And this is really the second beauty of donor advised funds is that they're creating a ready reserve for disasters and are really sustaining giving in the sector during economic downturns. And I'll give you just two quick examples. Um, one is of you know, how donor advised funds can really be money at the ready for disasters. Uh, just with this last hurricane, Hurricane Dorian, within two weeks of that hurricane, we sent out $9 million across almost 3,000 grants to about 400 nonprofits on behalf of our donors. In two weeks, that relief and that help for that disaster was there and working and on the ground. The second thing is we are seeing more and more as donor advised funds become popular that they're really sustaining um, the sector in the times of economic downturns. And I'll give you an example just from last year in 2018. I know many of you on the line will remember what happened last December in the middle of our giving season, right? Uh, the market tanked and was uh, in the worst uh, place it had been since the Great Depression. Well, when we ended the year last year, the number of contributions coming into Fidelity Charitable was down 9% but the number of grants going out the door was up 17%, indicating that again, donor advised funds are playing a really important role in the sector to sustain during economic downturn, because again, they are money that has been given away irrevocably to charity and there to tap into in times of disaster or when the market's not doing so good and you're thinking, mm, I'm not sure I can, can give quite as much this year. So this is really our goal today, is to help you understand who these donors are and how they give and how to unlock the potential for your organization. I'm just gonna step back for a moment. Um, most of you probably know what a donor advice fund is, but for anybody who does not, um, I like to just step back and, and explain what it is. Um, a donor advice fund, really think of it as a separate investment account for your charitable giving. It's like a mini foundation of sorts without all the administration, administrative burden. The money is given irrevocably to charity, and as a result, the donor is eligible to take an immediate tax deduction. Then, as the name implies, you, the donor, advise the sponsor, in this case, Fidelity Charitable, how you want the money to be invested and granted out to charities. Next slide. So Fidelity really did not uh, invent the donor advised fund. Um, uh, donor advised funds have been around a long time. Uh, the New York Community Trust actually pioneered this concept in 1931. And today there's over a thousand uh, donor advised fund sponsors 
that range from national donor advised fund providers like Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, NPT, to um, single issue uh, institutions. Uh, these are oftentimes uh, more your religious organizations um, or community foundations. I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the money uh, going into community foundations today really is going into donor advised funds at those foundations. Um, it's about, uh, Fidel, the National Donor Advised Funds represents about 50% of the accounts, single issue charities represent about 20% of the accounts, and uh, community foundations represent about 30% of donor advised fund accounts. Next slide. So Fidelity Charitable is a separate uh, nonprofit 501c3 organization, and we are governed by a separate uh, board of trustees. Our mission is to make giving accessible, simple, and effective. The data I'll be sharing with you today is based on Fidelity Charitable donors, which includes more than 200,000 donors from approximately 120,000 accounts. And I think this is a fairly good proxy um, for really thinking about how NDAF donors uh, give and behave in general. Today, Fidelity Charitable is one of the largest grant makers in the U.S., alongside the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on behalf of these very, very generous donors. The dollars granted out from our funds uh, to charities has grown five times in the last 10 years, uh, from a billion to 5.2 billion last year. And some of you may have seen that uh, just in the last week, uh, we already granted out $5.2 billion this year to charity, um, which is almost 10 weeks earlier um, than uh, this time last year. Um, so we're really already set to eclipse that $5.2 uh, billion uh, this year. This rapid growth of donor advised funds is really being felt in the sector and by many of you all, and it's raised a lot of questions. Um, and for many of you, I know the single biggest question I get day in and day out is, who are these donors and how do I get in front of them? I wanted to share a video, but given our technical, video, uh, technical challenges here today, I'm just going to tell you the story of Michael Bradley, because I think it, um, I'm gonna share some stats at the end, but I think it really illustrates um, if there is a typical Fidelity Charitable donor, I think, the story of Michael Bradley really kind of embodies that. Um, Michael actually received uh, a scholarship um, at a young age of $1,000, and that was really kind of the first um, seed of philanthropy that was planted in him. He later went on to be a very, very successful executive at a company in Boston um, and felt you know, very strongly about where he had come and the need to give back. He was driving to work one day and heard um, a, uh, a story in, on NPR about the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. He made an initial grant to them. The Boston Healthcare for the Homeless recognized that and invited him in for a tour and to learn a little bit more about what they do. Michael Bradley is now a continuing supporter of theirs um, and is very much engaged with them. And I share this story because I think uh, it really, he embodies a couple of things um, about our donors. The first is uh, the average age of our donors is about 65, but we see that the average age of starting an account is at about 55 years old. Um, again, that makes a lot of sense because people are getting to a point in their life where they've uh, perhaps paid off their mortgage or they're almost finished paying for college like me, <laughs> and they're thinking, hmm, kind of what's the next phase of my life? In fact, 62% tell us that they uh, have started their donor advised fund account to sustain their giving through retirement. I think the other interesting thing about our donors is they are super engaged. 79% tell us that they have volunteered in the last year. I think nationally that number is about 25%, which I think is even high. And then I've seen numbers for, you know, higher net worth uh, donors who where their um, kind of volunteerism is more like 69%. So again, we're seeing DAF donors as not just giving their their time or giving their money, but also giving their time. And then I think um, the other part of Michael's story is that. Uh, part of the reason he gave using a donor advised fund was the ability to give appreciated securities. And again, 76% of donors will say that giving appreciated assets such as publicly traded stock or privately held assets is 
a real important reason to them uh, as why they're using a donor advised fund. Often we see donors who have a large block of securities or they are selling a privately held business and they know they want to give to charity, but they either haven't decided which charity or what their cause area is, or they're just really not ready to make that large of a donation all in one fell swoop to one charity. And so donor advised fund is the perfect solution for them. And then uh, uh, lastly, again, this 68% of people saying that uh, kind of separating the when you have the money available uh, and when you make the decisions about when and who you want to give to is a really important factor for why people use donor advised fund. They are strategic and thoughtful uh, and want time to, to make the best decisions. The second reason we see, or a kind of second area that we see donors using donor advised funds is this whole idea of investment growth. Uh, in our lifetime, since Fidelity Charitable's inception 29 years ago, uh, we have created $9 billion incremental for charity that would not have existed because of this investment growth. Uh, and that's really how we think of ourselves as really increasing the philanthropic capital available so that you all uh, can do what you do best um, in meeting the, the end needs of um, uh, people and causes uh, around the world. You see that uh, this idea of investment growth is important because often people are faced with a high year-end bonus or a financial windfall. And again, they have a large block of money that they're looking to donate and not really ready to kind of make that decision all at once. The other reason that we see, not necessarily why people start a donor advised fund, but why they uh, get so excited about them is this idea to better organize and keep a record of giving. Again, if you think about it, it is much easier to write one check of $5,000 to Fidelity Charitable and that is what you have to keep track of for your kind of IRS uh, tax receipts um, versus having to track every single $50 grant that you might send out of your account. So really, um, we provide our donors with a dashboard that gives them a, a record and a history of um, their granting, um, and it really makes it simple for them to stay organized and know where they've given, how much they've given, uh, and to track their giving over time. Similarly, a lot of people are setting up donor advised funds because they want to set the money aside and bring their family to, together to around the table um, to talk about giving. It's a, a core value of their family uh, and they want to make sure the next generation, um, whether it be teenagers or young children or young adults, um, are also thinking about giving. The last thing I'll just note here, um, in addition to the $9 billion in uh, growth from the investments, is the other uh, thing I think we, Fidelity Charitable and other national DAFs do extremely well, is help take privately held, what we call more complex assets, and monetize those for charity. So again, these are things like real estate, um, private held interests of a business that somebody has spent 40 years building and is now ready to sell. Um, these are all things that are really hard to get to charity. Um, and that is one of the things that uh, I think uh, makes donor advised funds so attractive is that ability to donate some of these more complex, but often the most highly appreciated assets that a donor has in their portfolio. And again, in our lifetime, uh, we have created $6 billion of incremental money um, for philanthropy as a result of taking those very complex uh, assets and monetizing them so that people can turn around and give them to charity. Many people are surprised to understand the breadth of donors that are using donor advised funds. I hear all the time, oh, well, those funds are really for the wealthy. But our median account size is $17,000, and almost 60% of our giving accounts have balances less than $25,000. We've got another 8% of our accounts that have, have more than $250,000 in them. But again, you see here that we are serving a very, very wide range of donors. Um, this is not just uh, the wealthy who are using donor advised funds to make their giving simpler and more effective. 
You also see that our donors are very, very active grant makers. The average grants per account 10 years ago was about six, uh, and today it's a little more than 10. And the average grant size is $4,000. The other thing we see is as these accounts are growing, every single year we are seeing more and more million dollar grants go out the door. In 2018, that number was 582, which was a 15% increase in million dollar grants over the previous year. So again, uh, these donors are kind of run the gamut in terms of um, you know, their, their financial, financial situation and income. Uh, and are very actively uh, granting and giving. Another concern I often hear about donor advised funds is that uh, this money is actually just sitting in a parking lot or in a warehouse um, and not going out the door to charity. And our experience has really been the opposite. Um, again, we are seeing these donors being uh, actively, actively engage both in giving the money as well as volunteering with organizations. We track our uh, contributions on a first in, first out basis. And what we see is for every dollar that we take in as a contribution, within five years, 74 cents of that dollar has gone out the door to charity. And in 10 years, that's 88 cents of every dollar. So again, within a five to 10 year span, the vast majority of this money is being granted out to charity. Year over year, uh, and this is pretty typical of most donor advised funds, uh, our average payout is 20% or more. I think the other thing that I uh, often get questions about if you wanna forward one more slide is, well, where are these donors giving to? Um, and you'll see on the right-hand side of the slide that uh, it's interesting, most of the grants going out the door from our donors really mirror the sectors and the giving behavior of our nation at large. Um, the top groups are education, society benefit, and religion. You see some small differences in uh, education versus religion. Uh, for Fidelity charitable donors, they're slightly higher in terms of the amount of money given to education and slightly less in terms of religion. We think that reflects um, the, the type of folks who are learning about, interested in, and attracted to use a donor advised fund in that they often have been very successful uh, in their um, business career or otherwise uh, and uh, are more highly educated and looking uh, to give back to um, you know, education because they see that as an important thing that drove success for them in their life. I think the other thing that uh, I often get the question on is a lot of these dollars are going directly to the home states. So close to 50% of the grants that we give out uh, stay within the state of the, the state in which the donor resides. So again, donors are, are very engaged kind of at a local and regional level uh, to not just support national charities, but to support the causes that say they see on a local and regional level that need, need attention. So I think what you're seeing here is, I always like to say, and it dates me a little bit, um, this is not your father's Oldsmobile. And I'm not sure whether it's driven by, you know, the Gates giving pledge, but there's a notion in our country, and I think this is part of why donor advised funds are becoming so popular. There's a, a notion in the country that of, I want to see impact in my lifetime. No longer do you see really people setting aside money in a foundation that will live on in perpetuity beyond their death. Um, we're really seeing that uh, people who choose to use donor advised fund accounts are looking for impact in their lifetime. And whether that's you know kind of part of this just um, national psychological trend that we're seeing that was maybe propelled by the, the giving pledge, um, or whether it's because donor advised funds um, make it so simple and easy for people to give. And if you wanna go one more slide, um, I have a quick uh, screenshot of what it looks like um, in the granting process or to be a Fidelity Charitable donor. On the left you see when you log in, again, you can see a listing of the charities you've given to. And on the right-hand side, you see how easy it is in three steps to make a grant and how simple we make it. And again, I think this is another reason why um, donor advised funds have become so popular. 92% of our grants are recommended online. 
for you all, um, part of what I want you to, to recognize is that um, one of the things we do is we um, always default donors when they are in this kind of granting checkout flow. Um, it is always defaulted for them to provide their name and address to you. They actually have to uncheck a box if they want to give anonymously. 97% of the 1.3 million grants that we processed last year uh, went out the door with a name and typically a name and an address so that you can identify them. The second thing we do is default them to, uh, instead of for special purpose, that the grant go where needed most um, so that you all have the most flexibility with that money. And again, the donor would have to uncheck that box um, in order to set it up for special purpose. So again, we've made the process so simple and so streamlined for them. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons um, why this is a growing, why DAFs are such a growing trend. So let me just kind of summarize what we've been through in terms of the data about who these donors are. And you can go one more slide. These donors are giving strategically, they're actively involved and engaged, and they're giving locally. If you want to go one more slide. The reason, though, that I know many of you have joined our session today uh, is because the number one question I get is, okay, but how do I get in front of these donors, right? Um, and one of the first things I say is start by thinking about fishing in your own pond. You actually have donors who are giving to you using a donor advised fund, and you may not even be recognizing that they're giving to you that way or encouraging them to give to you that way. And so what I'm gonna share right now are six tips and techniques that I've seen other nonprofits use very, very successfully to really make DAF donors, um, this is such an important group of very generous people who have set money aside irrevocably for charity. And it's so important um, to be kind of following the best practices uh, to make sure that that's uh, a critical part of your fundraising strategy. I already talked about this a little bit. Um, the first is to recognize who these donors are and tag them correctly in your database. Again, 97% of grants go out the door with donor information. Um, and what you see here on the left-hand side is the transmittal letter that you would receive from us. And whether you're getting um, checks from us or whether you're uh, getting electronic funds, grants from us electronically, we provide uh, whatever information the donor gives us. And again, 97% of the time they're giving us their name and or address. Um, and then the other thing to recognize is make sure that you are comparing that to your current database so that um, if you have programs where you have platinum, gold, where you're recognizing donors for their total contributions, that you're matching what they may have given to you via check and other vehicles with what they're giving to you from their donor advised fund so you can add it all up. And then the last thing I would say here is always make sure that um, we often get thank you letters thanking us for our contribution or our grant to your organization. And really what you want to do is make sure that you are sending a note to the donor to thank them and recognize that they were using their donor advised fund account to give to you. And here on the right hand side, and we'll send these slides out later because some of this is, is very small to see on the webinar. But on the right hand side, you see an example of how Habitat for Humanity does that. The second thing and top tip that I've seen is just like we talked about with Michael Bradley, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless was so smart. They recognize that while his initial gift may not have been huge, he was giving through a donor advised fund. And so you always want to make sure, I tell people all the time, if you have somebody who's giving through a donor advised fund, again, they have irrevocably set money aside for charity. You want to invite them in, you want to steward them as a um, high potential donor, invite them in to learn about your organization, learn about your store, learn about your story um, so that uh, you can engage them in a unique and a different way. And you see here, I've pulled from a letter St. Jude provided us with, um, I'd be happy to learn more about your specific um, uh, funding goals or to arrange a site visit to St. Jude to see firsthand how your support is making a difference. So again, much like Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, they're doing the same, which is really trying to engage in a different way at a different level with these donors. The other thing I encourage people to do is 
make sure you're thinking about the advantages of the donor advised fund account feature. Most donors who have given using a donor advised fund or 42% have a bequest or some legacy giving vehicle or are planning to set one up. That is much higher than what we typically see, which is in the maybe high teens of people who have kind of thought this through and have some sort of bequest or planned legacy giving vehicle. So these people, again, are more thoughtful, more strategic, and they have the opportunity on their donor advice fund to name a successor. And we encourage you to invite them to name you as their successor. And you can see an example of that here, uh, again, from uh, St. Jude's of, you know, very thoughtfully thinking about how you say to somebody, we invite you or encourage you to think about making St. Jude's, um, you know, your successor on your donor advised fund account. I know one specific charity who did this and within a week of putting that in a newsletter, she already had one donor call her and say, I've actually just made you the successor on my account and upon my death, you will get all of that money. The other thing that you can do with a donor advised fund is set pre-scheduled grants. About 25% of all the grants that go out the door um, from Fidelity Charitable are pre-scheduled. And so if you know you have a donor um, who is interested in your cause, who maybe gives to you once or twice a year, maybe encourage them to set up a pre-scheduled grant or a reoccurring grant. The beauty of that for you all is the ability to kind of control your cash flow and know what's coming in the door on a regular basis. The third tip is make sure you're integrating DAFs into all of your marketing materials as another way to give. Um, I see many organizations at the checkout. Uh, you have use uh, PayPal, use Apple Pay, use credit cards, send us a check, but not everybody is saying use your donor advice fund. And by doing this, you are encouraging them to stop and pause and think, and what may have been a $25 check or credit card donation to you could turn into something much bigger if you make them stop and pause and think about, oh, wait a minute, I've got this account, and you've made it really easy for them to give using a donor advised fund account. The, uh, for any of you uh, who are not aware, uh, you might wanna go to daftdirect.org if you go to daftdirect.org, uh, it is a consortium of donor advised fund providers. And what we've done is built a widget that you can use either on your website or in your marketing uh, email and digital materials, um, or even in your hard copy letters uh, that allows people to directly click over to their account login. So let's say for an example, I am a donor of yours and you have the widget on your checkout page. I click Daft Direct. It, I click that I have an account with Fidelity Charitable. It takes me directly to the Fidelity Charitable login and it automatically populates your organization's name in my grant checkout cart. So there's no uh, questioning, do I have the right organization? Is it the right one in the right state? Am I calling it the right name? Is it something else? Um, it automatically populates the name in that kind of granting workflow. And then all the donor has to do is decide how much to give and click send. Um, very, very simple. So if you haven't looked at daftdirect.org, I would really encourage you to do that as well. And we'll send a link out afterwards to this. But if you go online to daftdirect.org, um, there is a way that you can take this um, widget that we've created and put it on your website or in your marketing materials. And that automatically creates a link to the donor advice fund account login page. And once you get beyond login, it takes you to the granting workflow and automatically populates the name of your organization in the grant flow. And so that's a really easy streamlined way for you all to make it easy for somebody to give from their donor advice fund. But even if you don't use that link, I would still encourage you to be mentioning that you can give to us using credit card, check, Apple Pay, all your forms, and using your donor advised fund account, just as a reminder to people who have those accounts out there. This next slide just goes one step deeper on what that uh, DAF Direct widget can do for you. 
Um, many, some of you may be familiar with Pan Mass Challenge. Uh, it's a bike ride uh, in Boston, and it uh, supports uh, the Dana Farber Cancer uh, Organization. Um, and Pan Mass has probably taken this staff direct widget further than anybody, and that's why I like to share it as an example. And again, this is on that daftdirect.org site as a case study. And with this, you can actually um, go in. You see here a picture of my friend Beth, who rides in this every year. And if Beth, in her uh, request to me for funding and sponsorship of her bike ride, puts that DAF Direct link in my letter, I click on it, I go to my account checkout, and it not only populates Pan Mass Challenge, but it also populates in a drop down, I'm allowed to choose Beth as the person I'm sponsoring. So not only does Pan Mass get the money, but Beth as the writer also gets the credit. And I know so many of you do um, dance marathons, walks, runs, races, all kinds of things. Um, so I'd really encourage you to look at Pan Mass Challenge as an example of, again, really making it simple for donor advised fund donors um, to give to you and to sponsor um, those folks who are doing the rides and the walks and the runs. Second to last thing I'm going to mention here is helping us get the funds to you faster. Uh, and there's a twofold part here. Uh, the first is uh, many nonprofits don't know that we are taking a database feed from the IRS on a monthly basis. So the first thing I would encourage you to do is check your address and how you are listed in the IRS database. If your name that you use on the IRS database is not consistent with the name you use in your fundraising, there's going to be a disconnect when the donor tries to go to give to you. So that's job number one. Job number two would be if you are receiving paper grants from us, uh, it is only three quick steps to sign up to receive these funds electronically. Um, and I would really encourage that because it gets the money to you uh, so much faster and then you are able to act on getting that thank you out to the donor um, in a much more expedient way uh, and engage with them in the way I know you want to. And then the last thing I'll share if you want to go to the, the final tip slide here is make sure that you are talking about uh, your mission and the work you do um, uh, and, and sharing your story in the right way. We actually have on our website, and again, you can, can go to our website, we'll send a link to this afterwards. We have a program called Boost Your Giving IQ. And within that program, we have nine questions you should ask every nonprofit. Take a look at those questions and uh, make sure that when a donor is coming on site that you're thinking through those questions, make sure that you're answering those questions and updating your profile on GuideStar and Charity Navigator because those are tools we're pointing donors to. And so you really want to make sure that the um, story you're telling, whether it be in your communications or whether it be a site visit uh, or whether it be on GuideStar, Charity Navigator, or many of the other uh, organizations out there that help uh, donors learn more about nonprofits, uh, we think this is a pretty good guide to follow in terms of helping donors understand um, who you are and what to ask. So that was a lot of information. Again, we'll send these slides out, um, but the you know six key tips are recognize who these donors are, make sure you're syncing it up with your database of donors um, and thanking them, not us. You want to make sure that you're putting these donors at the top of your list in terms of uh, the, the level of engagement uh, you're trying to drive with them. You want to encourage them to take advantage of DAF features, uh, particularly uh, asking them to name you as uh, their successor on their account. Uh, integrate DAFs uh, and giving from a DAF into all of your existing marketing materials. Uh, look at your how you are being set up, uh, how your how your organization is listed uh, on with the IRS, uh, and making sure you're signed up for electronic uh, funds transfer for grants coming to your organization. Uh, and then last is helping to make sure your story for how you uh, talk about your organization is crisp, uh, not only for site visits but again in all of the information that's out there on. Um, 
uh, organizations that help donors uh, uh, think through and evaluate uh, nonprofit organizations. So Ruth, that is all I had in terms of the prepared remarks. Yeah, I have, uh, oh my gosh, I have so many questions lined up for you. So I'm gonna try to um, collapse some of them and uh, make sure we get to as many as we can. Um, so there were a number in here that really have to do, um, Amy, with um, just the degree to which people at Fidelity advise donors on who to fund. Um, and so there are some follow-up questions around that having to do with, okay, how do I get to those advisors? Um, what exactly does that look like? Is there any way for me to get in front of these people as a group? Um, you know, those kinds of questions. So could, could we start with that? Um, just to what degree do you do any advising with donors about who they may wish to fund? Yeah, great question. And one, one I get all of the time. So as a national provider, uh, we are um, both uh, cause and geographic neutral is how we like to think of ourselves. So we really aren't um, advising or directing or recommending uh, at all. Uh, I'll tell you there's uh, one exception to that, which is in the time of disasters, we often get many, many phone calls from our donors saying, I want to help with Hurricane Dorian, but I don't know where to give. So we have partnered with the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. They will uh, scan the universe and come up with a list of people that they can, organizations they can verify are helping with that specific disaster and they know uh, and can verify or have boots on the ground and are helping with that disaster. We rely on them to do that work because we don't have the expertise and we will publish that list if you look um, on our site at uh, some of the disasters we've covered. Um, we are getting that list from them. That is about the only time we will publish a list just because the need is so urgent and our phones really uh, ring off the hook often when there is a, a large scale disaster of people wanting to help and not knowing where to help. Um, the other place that uh, we will work with donors more uh, uh, hand to hand, uh, we have uh, uh, philanthropic consultants and so for our most generous donors who need a little more help because their granting is more complex, they're trying to either give a very large grant or um, they're trying to build the side of a hospital wing or trying to give internationally or trying to get their family to align around how to give. Um, we do have a group of philanthropic consultants who will work with those donors. Again, they're not so much recommending what those donors give to as much as helping with their approach and the mechanics of how to get their giving done. Um, occasionally, the donor will say, I'm interested in this issue area. And so what that group will do is work to provide some information about that issue area as well as some organizations they might consider. But again, the majority of the time, our philanthropic consultants are helping with kind of the approach. They're doing a lot of family meetings um, and the mechanics of some more complicated granting. Right. So I think that this is one of the major confusions about, about donor advised funds. Is, is there anybody recommending to the donors or, or raising, you know, kind of surfacing potential grantees to donors? Um, so what you're saying is, in general, that's not the way it goes. Um, and it, only with um, some of the larger, more complex giving, and you can bet that everybody's going to want to know, how do I get to those guys? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I would I would say that is that is actually kind of um, one of the differences why somebody would choose a national donor advised fund provider is we see our donors are pretty self directed um, versus somebody who might open one at a community foundation might actually be looking for a different level of help and direction around where and how to give that money out um, and so I I think that's one of the big differences why somebody would use a community foundation. Um, versus a national donor advice fund. Right. So, 
as uh, I, I want to then go to another question, which I think is related, um, which I think people are slightly confused about, um, which is you use a language um, that donor rec donors recommend grants, but it's pretty clear that donors direct most grants in essence. Can you talk a little bit about the, you know, kind of the, the vagueness in, in those two descriptions? Yeah, um, so I think this gets to the heart of what a donor advised fund is, is that once you've given the money to a donor advised fund, um, it technically is a fund of the charity, of Fidelity Charitable. And that's why you are called a donor advisor on the account and why you recommend grants versus direct grants. Um, we, Fidelity Charitable, only allow donors to recommend grants to IRS qualified 501c3 public charities, and they must be used solely for charitable purpose. And this is set forth, um, this is based on policies set forth by our board of trustees. The IRS, as you all know, is the principal U.S. government uh, agency that uh, really determines whether a uh, public charity is qualified. Uh, and if a charity were to um, be disqualified by the IRS, we would stop giving immediately. And again, our, our board of trustees take this very, very seriously, and they are um, they have set policies and procedures in place by which we are reviewing grants to make sure that um, there is no donor benefit, that the, the grant actually is being used for charitable purposes, um, aligned to um, kind of, again, IRS and other federal and state regulators. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I hope that clears it up for people. And if there, you know, if you have any kind of remaining questions around that. I think that these are some of the most important, um, you know, the, the most important pieces to take away from this presentation. Who does the recommending? Who is, who, who is kind of organizing things behind the scenes? And I think what Amy said is that differs from um, donor advised sponsor to donor advised sponsor. In some cases, um, it, with community foundations, you'll have people really actively advising donors. Um, and in other cases, as in Fidelity, really not. Um, it's, it's much more hands off. Um, I think the, you know, there's been a number of questions in here as well, and it may, it may be in response to a question that um, that was published this morning about, um, the, it was in the Forward, um, which is a Jewish newspaper, which talked about Jewish federations disallowing grants because of um, their, because of their own political principles. Um, not because the organizations were Ill, illegal or illegitimate, illegitimate in any kind of a, a, of a legal way. And does fidelity ever um, disallow donations for um, political, for, you know, does it put, put donors through any kind of a political screen? Yeah, so first of all, um, the, the grant or the donation from the donor can only go to a 501c3, so this cannot be used for political purposes. And again, I go back to um, kind of the single issue donor advised funds versus a fidelity charitable where we are cause and geographic neutral, right? So I'm not really familiar with um, the case you're referencing, um, uh, Ruth. But again, if you're a single issue charity and you have set up a donor advised fund for a specific purpose and mission, um, then you may put a lot more restrictions around who that money can go to and what that money is for. Again, a difference between a DAF set up as a, at a single uh, issue charity versus a community foundation versus a national donor advised fund. Again, what we are doing though is absolutely making sure these grants are being screened first and foremost for are they an IRS um, uh, qualified charity in good standing. We are also using um, news reports uh, and other sources of public record uh, to make sure that um, there are not, uh, these grants are not being used for 
purposes other than charitable activity. Right. Okay. So <laughs> I have had a number of questions from um, one person today who is asking about, I'm going to just read you um, one of her, one of her questions. Given the report Fidelity has published on impact investing, how is Fidelity Charitable holding themselves accountable to impact investing, given that you currently funnel money via donor advised funds to groups who practice organized bigotry? That's the question. Yeah, so again, it, it really gets back to, um, you know, the, the scan we are constantly doing um, to take a look and to ensure that the organizations that we are granting to are uh, for charitable activity. Uh, and we are looking at, you know, financial fraud, we're looking at money laundering, terrorism, hate crimes, we're looking at all of those things. Um, and we may from time to time make a ruling that either because there have been questions um, at the state level or the federal level about a charity, um, or uh, in doing some due diligence that that charity is not for charitable purpose, that we may decide that the grant should not go through. Um, right. And that's how we hold ourselves accountable. Again, that is all documented in um, the, the program guidelines that are set forth and reviewed uh, a couple of times a year by our board of trustees. Okay, and um, so there's two or three other questions. I'm going to go a little beyond time, so those of you that are interested can stick with us. Um, we're not going to go much beyond time, but we're um, So how often would you say do you refuse to make a grant that's recommended by the donor? Oh, gosh. Um I would answer honestly, but I don't, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, and again, because it varies, um, this is a constant scan that we're doing. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I don't know the answer to that, to be perfectly honest, in terms of uh, how many grants uh, we had recommendations on and we, we held. I, I just don't know, Ruth. I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's fine. And then... Um, do you provide any rankings or ratings? I think you've already answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Of nonprofits um, for your donors? No, we do not. If you go into um, our website, uh, there is a section about uh, uh, finding charities or reviewing charities or evaluating charities. I forget exactly what the wording is. Um, but it actually uh, really points you to other tools that are available, like GuideStar, uh, Charity Navigator, Better Business Bureau. It points donors to all of those other tools and resources. Um, it's not really necessary for us to uh, kind of reinvent the wheel when there are other people out there who are already doing that. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to ask just one other question, and, and I think you've a little bit addressed this, but I'd like you to go a little bit deeper into it, which is the whole question of mandatory payout. Um, do you require a mandatory payout of your individual funds? Um, so beyond the beyond kind of the averages, do you, is there something that you require of your donors in terms of how quickly they spend the money that they put into their own donor advised funds? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we do, again, getting back to our board of trustees, uh, the policy that they've put uh, in place um, is strictly adhered to, and it's a very active grant-making policy that they uh, require that we have. And what it means is that donors must make a grant from their account every three years. And at three years, if you have not made a grant from your account, we start a knocking on your door and hunting you down. Uh, at the end of year four, if you still have not made a grant, uh, we will make a 5% grant and our trustees will grant that money out. And then by the end of year five, if you again still have not taken action, the entire account will be granted out uh, by the trustees. Again, where our trustees are giving to can all be found on our public website. Uh, if, uh, if anybody is interested, a report. Our trustees are really focused on two key areas, which is 
um, investing in building uh, infrastructure uh, for the sector. Um, so people are doing things around data and systems that help the, the, the sector get stronger as a whole. And then this notion of kind of uh, donor education uh, and donor effectiveness. Those are really the, the two areas that uh, they are spending um, uh, time granting to uh, with any of this money that uh, uh, should not be uh, paid out from the accounts. We see very, very few accounts go dormant like that, um, but it is something we monitor regularly and communicate with our donors on regularly and our trustees require that we have and follow a very, very strict policy around that so that the money is not kind of sitting there and not going to charity. Right. So um, there is, of course, a question and follow-up to that is, can you apply for a grant for the funds that you're, are being mandatorily distributed? <laughs> our, our trustees have a uh, plan by which they request grants. And again, it's in those two specific areas. So we don't really have uh, an open uh, request for proposal. Right. Okay. Um, I want to I, I, I wanna just, um, before you leave, don't leave yet, guys. Um, I want to answer the one of the first questions we had, which was just where on our site can you find information about donor advised funds and um, as you might suspect if you go to to our search function and type in donor advised funds or daf um, you will find a very long list of um of articles and newswires um, that take up just about every aspect of um, both, you know, kind of both the advocacy for and the criticisms of donor advised funds um, and policy, you know, uh, policy proposals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so feel free if, if you want to go look a little bit further because donor advised funds are such an overwhelming success in terms of how they've grown. Um, they necessarily do attract um, attention for regulation. Um, so it, it, it is a, you know, it's a very, that's a very active conversation out there. Um, I do also want to point out, and this is a, a good chance of, 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 for saying this, that, I, that um, Fidelity Charitable Trustees um, does fund NPQ. And so <laughs> I don't want you later to find that out and say, well, what was this? Um, so I'm doing the disclosure. But in doing the disclosure, I also want to say that um, at no time in no way has uh, Fidelity Charitable Trustees ever um, fussed about anything that we have written, some of it critical, about um, donor advised funds. Um, so um, that's all to the wonderful. Um, beyond that, um, I would like to just, uh, I, I have one last thing to say before I say goodbye to Amy, who, Amy, I, I learned so much during this webinar and I thought I knew a lot already. So um, in a minute, I just want to say thank you and goodbye to you. But um, I do want to say also that NPQ um, is supported mostly by our readers and you who are listening to this webinar. It's so important to us um, that you do support us so that when we bring you a free webinar like this that's chock full of information, um, that we do it, we can do that with a, with a great deal of kind of editorial independence, et cetera. So I want to tell you about one particular thing which you will find in your inbox as I'm speaking, which is an invitation to join our, um, our cutting edge, our, our leading edge membership program, um, which actually will get you in free to everything we do. Um, so this is one free webinar we do, but we're going to be doing six other webinars um, just in the next few months. And you'll have access to all of those that have to do with how to be the best kind of board chair, um, how to budget, um, and when to start budgeting and what to consider in doing your budgets these days, particularly with some of the new 
accounting standards and that kind of thing. So please, um, you also get a digital subscription to our magazine. So please look for that um, email, which should be in your inbox now and sign up today for the Leading Edge membership. So with that, I want to say, Amy, again, I learned a lot um, listening to you today. And I so appreciate the, you know, kind of your willingness to do this and to take questions um, openly and, and, um, and try to give people information about this thing, which we, you know, many still remain mystified by. Is there any last uh, words of advice or... Um, you know, kind of cheerleading that you'd like to do for the people on this session? Ruth, I would just say thank you very much for the opportunity to dispel some of those myths. Um, I often have people say to me, um, yeah, but you don't really work for a mission-driven organization. And I say, yes, I do. Our goal is to make giving accessible, simple, and effective. And what gets me out of bed in the morning is the fact that um, I do see how we're making giving uh, simpler and friction-free uh, for donors. Um, and when I see the increased uh, power of uh, additional capital for charity, uh, um, it really just makes me um, so excited about the power that donor advised funds have. Again, I go back to the 79 more children, uh, preschool children educated in Ohio, and it just makes my heart happy. So. Uh, I hope uh, you all are encouraged about uh, the power of uh, what these can do um, for philanthropy. Great. And I, I will say to people, there were about 550 people on this webinar. You're asking how many other people were on it. So it was about 550. And there's, um, you know, there are more that expressed interest and the timing wasn't great for them. But we will keep in touch with you and we're going to keep in touch with Amy. And as things change in, um, in that whole realm, um, we'll be inviting Amy back to talk about various, um, you know, various things that they're doing to improve the experience, both on the donor side and the nonprofit side. So thank you again, Amy. I, we completely appreciate your time and intelligence on all of this and we will be talking to you soon great thank you ruth okay bye